Good morning, friends, and welcome to Valley Community Church Online on this Easter Sunday. We're so excited that you have joined us, and this is going to be a little different Easter with it being online. So the first thing I would say is just let us know you're here. If you would check in on the comments, just to let us know you're here. This morning, you'll hear this phrase several times, he is risen, and the common response to that is, he is risen indeed. So maybe that's a great way to start this morning in the comments. Just let us know, he is risen indeed, and you're welcome to give comments throughout the message, throughout the music this morning, giving praise and thanksgiving to God. In just a few moments, there'll be a countdown timer on the screen, and that will count down to our service. There'll be some music playing towards that. And here's a little bonus. If you want to take a picture and show us where you're joining us from this morning during that time, we would love that too. After that, Matt will start our service with the introduction, some scripture and some prayer. We'll have worship and song teaching. So we'll see you in about four minutes. He is risen. He is risen indeed.
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Who would have imagined that we would be celebrating the most celebrated day of the year for the church from our homes? But here we are. I'm speaking to you from my home to yours. Paul's going to join us in a little bit from his home. But we are so thankful that God has given us this opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Around the world, this is the most important religious holiday. But for us, it's much more important than that. It is a relationship holiday. It is a day we celebrate having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And our prayer is this, as you join us for this Sunday worship, that God will move in special ways in your heart and encourage you. I'm going to take some time to read a passage of scripture and then have a word of prayer as we begin. This is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8, and describes the opening of the tomb on Easter Sunday morning. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day? And they remembered his words. This story will probably reach more people this Easter than ever before, just because of technology. And we'd like to pray that God would give his word favor as it circumvents the globe. Let's bow together. We come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, the one who suffered at our own hands, was crucified, buried, and now risen from the dead offering eternal life to all who will believe. We come boldly, confidently, and thankfully because of the shed blood of the Lamb of God who has given us access to you. We confess our sins. We confess our need for you. We confess our love for you. May you bless this day and hallow it as you, your name is preached to the ends of the earth. May many turn to you for life and life to the fullest. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to turn things over to Paul, and he'll be leading in worship from his home. Thanks, Matt. It's a great day of celebration here on Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We sing of Christ in who our hope is found. The end of the verse says, Because of this, we have no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Sing with us. found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving sees, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love. 
righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live Every 
chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion. drum and jill and olivia chloe behind the camera thanks for worshiping with us we go into our time of teaching this morning jesus christ the resurrected savior we have power in the resurrection matt turn it over to you there are events in history that change the way we live i believe we're in such a place as that now think back to 9 11 Think back to the major wars. Think back to the crash of the stock market in 1929. We think back even further to the 14th century when the bubonic plague swept through Europe, killing one out of three people. It's estimated 100 million people perished. We will remember this. Our children will remember this. But I ask myself, what was the greatest plague or the greatest epidemic, the greatest pandemic in the history of mankind. And I think we go all the way back to the book of Genesis to find that. In, in Romans, the Apostle Paul describes it this way, as by one man, sin entered into the world. In other words, by one man, Adam, every single person was infected by sin. He says, as one man, sin entered into the world and death by that, so that sin passed upon all men for that all have sinned. When you think about this, that when Adam sinned, it made everyone that came after him of his descendants sinners. They had that not only in their DNA, they had that in their nature to commit sin. And the problem is that that sin was incurable. There was nothing that could cure man of his sin, and that infection, that sin, always led to death. There were no exceptions. 
There were no percentages of survival. Every person who sinned would eventually die. And so the answer we find now and center our thinking at, at Easter is Jesus Christ. And while throughout history before Jesus, there were many things that people would do to address the symptoms, but there was never that cure. This morning, what I'd like to do is to look at a passage of Scripture from the New Testament, not necessarily reading the account of the resurrection, but the effect of the resurrection on one man's life. The man is the Apostle Paul. He's written many of the epistles and writings of the New Testament, but we learn from his experience the impact and the, the change that took place as a result of the resurrection. The text that I'd like for us to look at is Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, where Paul said, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being more, made conformed or conformable to his death. You know, the Apostle Paul is speaking about a personal experience with Christ. When he says that I may know him, it's not speaking of an intellectual knowledge of facts, but it is speaking about a personal engaging experience that took place in his life. And it totally changed him. And he'll make reference to these events back in the gospel accounts of the resurrection. But it, it follows this progress. For Jesus, it began with suffering, death, and resurrection. For Paul, as he took on this life of following Jesus, it began with resurrection, new life, and then following Jesus, suffering, which took place in his life, and eventually death. But I'd like to focus on just this part of what he says. I want to know him. I want to know Jesus by personal experience. And I want to know the life of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. You know, when we think of Easter, it is the most significant religious holiday. But it should be more than that to you. It should be the most life-changing event that has taken place for you and for me. This morning, what I'd like to is just to consider three ways that the power of this resurrection has impacted the life of the Apostle Paul because he speaks about it throughout his writings. The first of these is the power of the resurrection for Paul brought salvation. In fact, we can read about his salvation testimony in Acts chapter 9. He is at that time, a successful man. He's a successful businessman. He is a religious leader. He is a member of the Sanhedrin. He is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's the kind of guy that's crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, does everything right. And he was so zealous about the truth and preserving uh, Judaism in Israel that he was on a mission to wipe out Christianity. And as he, he was traveling to the city of Damascus, he met Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ. And a, and a bright, shining light blinded the Apostle Paul. And he asked, who are you? Who are you? And the response was, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. And he says, it's hard for you, Paul, to kick against the ox goads. They have these long, heavy, pointed sticks to move cattle. And it's like the Apostle Paul, in all of his passion, all of his fervor, all of his intense religiosity, is kicking against one of these pointed ox goes. But God in his mercy has rescued him. When I think about this, the, the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, gives us the opportunity to have salvation. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all have sinned. So, 
we need saving. When you think about the, the epidemic that we face, every person in the world faces of being a sinner, not being able to save themselves, that the consequence of having that disease, that infliction of sin, is always death, 100% of the time. We need saving. We need rescuing. We need rescuing from our sin. We need rescuing from our death. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, it says, In Adam all died, and in Christ shall all be made alive. So when we talk about the gospel, it literally means good news. The, what is the good news? The good news is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. And that the gospel is the remedy for this pandemic of sin and death. And Jesus Christ is central in all of that. This is what he has communicated. And the part about this that I find so exciting, it is 100% effective <laughs> because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to wash away our sins. He rose again the third day to give us life and to give us life eternal. So I think the challenge is when we, we think about people infected by this all around the world is the instruction we get on the airplane where they say, in the case of an emergency, put on you parents, put on your mask first. <laughs> and then help your child. So my prayer is this, that you would take this personally first before you even have the opportunity to be able to help someone else. The power of the resurrection to bring salvation. But secondly, what we see in Paul's life is the power of the resurrection to bring transformation. When I say transformation, I mean that, that when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the power of that resurrected life, in other words, conquering death and giving life, will change everything about us. It's a, we could call it growth, we could call it change, we could call it maturity, we could call it development. But when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, God begins changing their life. It's a very exciting thing. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, these are great words. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the mighty working of his strength, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him and his right hand in the heavens. When I think of Paul's change, when you when you begin in, I think, Acts chapter 7, when we first get introduced uh, to the Apostle Paul, he is party to putting uh, Stephen to death for preaching the gospel. He's harassing the church uh, worldwide. When he becomes a Christian in Acts chapter 9, everything begins to change. And I think a, a summary statement is what he says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, verse 20, where, where he, he speaks about the uh, commitment that he has toward Christ and recognizing that the life that is now being lived is Christ living in him. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is really talking about a death to the old Paul, a death to the old way, a death to the old life. And everything has been changing as Christ is living his life, that resurrected life, in and through the Apostle Paul. And the evidence of that we find in the, at the end, close to the end of Galatians in chapter 5, verse 24. When it says, the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the evidence of this new life, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we go from this proud, striving man to all of these changes. 
in my personal experience of coming to Christ, I came to, to Jesus and salvation when I was a young boy. I remember it. I have no doubts that I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And I knew that I had eternal life. I knew he forgave my sins and that I would go to heaven someday. But I really didn't get engaged in getting to know him. Like Paul is saying that I may know him. And this power to not just save a young boy, but to change my life, the transformational power to change my life. When I was at the very end of high school, uh, a friend of mine took interest in me and began encouraging me to read my Bible. I'd never done that consistently. I'd hit or miss. Um, I'd, I'd say I believe everything in the Bible, but I, I really wasn't reading it. And just to kind of get him off my back, I started reading my Bible every day. And an amazing thing started to happen. God's Word began to change my life. And I, and I started realizing what it meant to have the life of Christ in me through His Word and prayer, changing me to become more and more like Christ. And my life just radically changed. And everyone around me saw that at that time. And I, and I felt a new sense of purpose for my life. Well, that's God's will for every single person, not just for you to experience the power of the resurrection in salvation, but to experience the power of the resurrection in the transformation of your life. He wants you to grow and to change and to become like him. But we move to the, the final impact that I see with the Apostle Paul that's really, to me, just tremendous, is that it's the power of the resurrection that brought about proclamation. In other words, it's like the Apostle said in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, he said, we cannot but speak. We cannot help ourselves. We have got to say something. I am so excited. It would be like someone finding the cure. I mean, just a guaranteed 100% cure for the COVID-19 virus. Now, if you found that, people would be excited. You, you would be so excited about that if you had a loved one that was infected or dying. You could not wait to tell them about it and to make sure that they got that remedy, that cure for what they had. And so the proclamation is the good news that is announced. Our motivation is, is one out of gratitude and thanksgiving for what God has given to us. You know, I believe right now that with this COVID-19 virus and the fear that's running across our country, the insecurity, the financial pressure, uh, the strain on people, that we have one of the greatest opportunities to talk to people about the real pandemic. And it's not to minimize the, the physical, earthly, temporal pandemic, but this pandemic will pass like others have too. But the one that we have never been able to resolve, the, the problem of sin and the problem of death, that Jesus has resolved both of these on, on this weekend almost 2,000 years ago. And so we have the opportunity to express that, uh, the joy of salvation. And the fact that this remedy, this cure, extends to the furthest part of the earth, to every creature, God's not willing that any should perish, but everyone should come to repentance. It, it will forgive and cleanse and heal the worst sinner uh, at the, the farthest place on the earth. And he, he is announcing this. And when Jesus left the earth, he gave what we call the Great Commission. He said, I want you to go tell, go tell this good news. So uh, this is what, what Paul says. He says, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. And so Paul was not ashamed of it. I think sometimes I, I can tend to be ashamed or shy or <clears throat> not know what to say or not want to butt in or not want to say something to someone. Uh, but the Apostle Paul experienced a, a power to be able to communicate the gospel. I've shared this story a few times recently, but to me it's just amazing that, that in Philippians chapter 1, we find Paul writing a letter 
to uh, his friends in Philippi, and he was in a Roman jail. And you would think that he'd be really frustrated because this proclamation, uh, the resurrection power to proclaim, seems to have been shut down, completely shut down. Uh, he was planning on going to Spain, uh, sharing about Jesus, and here he is in a Roman prison, chained to soldiers. And we're that way a lot. We get frustrated with the way God's doing things, and this doesn't seem to make any sense. But what happened is all of these uh, emperor's elite guards, as they watched him, would hear him share the good news of eternal life. And many of uh, Caesar's imperial guard came to Christ in salvation. And uh, then they, not only were they saved, but they started really getting grounded and grew. So when they got reassigned, where did they get reassigned to? To the far regions of the Roman Empire. So what happened is where Paul didn't go anywhere, soldiers went everywhere, and the gospel literally exploded. It just literally exploded. So you see, God's good news, his, his word is not bound up by these circumstances. Many times the circumstance, the difficult circumstance, creates an even greater opportunity as it did for the Apostle Paul. I, I liken this challenge we face to be that very way. So how do I share? How do I share the good news? And uh, I'd like to end with this because I think it's just a, this is the greatest story ever told. People, people have two unresolvable problems. And I, and I mean, every person who's ever lived has two unresolvable problems. They're sinners and they're gonna die. They're infected and there is no cure. And the hope is Jesus, who died on the cross for their sins and rose again to give them eternal life. A lot of times I just don't feel real bold about proclaiming that. But if you have a friend or a loved one, then I, I would suggest this. Rather than thinking about your speech, think about listening. Just listen. Let them tell their story. And as they tell that story, you be praying, God help me to respond in ways as I have permission from them to share my story can be what we call a personal testimony. So what I've shared with you this morning is when, when Paul in Philippians 3.10 says, this is my goal, this is my aim, that I may know him, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. And that resurrected power for Paul brought him salvation, it brought, brought transformation, and it brought proclamation. So this Sunday, this Easter Sunday, I'd like to encourage you to think about these things, to give thanks to God for your salvation. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, I pray that you do that today. There'll be a, little, a link uh, to YouTube and Facebook that you can click on to on this last week, I made a little 20-minute video that just kind of walks through how to become a Christian and how to know that you have eternal life. I'd suggest that if you are a believer, that you go through that so you can be uh, more skilled and knowledgeable about how to share. And if, if you've never heard the gospel or you, you're not sure about where you're going when you die, that you would listen to this. This is something you can pass on to a friend and share with them. To me, that's a, that's a great opportunity. And I pray that this day, even though we're separated in many ways, that we'll be able to enjoy the great fellowship of believers, even, even as we're doing online. So these are the three ways that the power of the resurrection can change your life. Salvation by faith in Jesus. Transformation by allowing his life to be lived in you as you walk with him and proclamation, looking for someone who's sick and dying and sharing with them the good news of eternal life. So do you know, do you know by experience the power of this resurrection? I pray you do, and I pray that if you do, you'll pass it on. Paul? Thanks, Matt, for the preaching and the teaching from God's Word. Power in the resurrection. Sing with us as we proclaim the power that is found in 
day. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks for joining us.